privilege of introducing uh, Glenn Rep. Um, beside Michael, uh, his son, I have known Glenn uh, the longest, and uh, I talked to Mike this morning. Mike's a young guy, 30 years old. I've known Glenn for 20 plus years, but I really know Glenn better than Mike because, as I told all of you in January, uh, although a focused man, Glenn was somewhat of an absentee father to his young son, Michael. When I first met Mike, uh, he was playing catch in his little league uniform out in the yard. And I said, where's your dad? And Mike said, you know the garage door can play catch better than my dad. A sad statement. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn is a man of focus. That is the topic for this morning. Not easily distracted or derailed, dissuaded from his goal. There's been occasions where Glenn could have been uh, taken off task. NASA called one time and said, Glenn, we're sending people to the moon. We'd love for you to join the Apollo program. He says, no, get somebody else. They said, you're kidding. He said, I'm afraid of heights. Call <laughs> they call a guy named Buzz somebody. <laughs> President calls Glenn up. He says, Glenn, I want you to be on my console for physical fitness. He says, no, it's a waste of time. Call somebody else. International Olympic Committee called Glenn. Said, hey, we're, we want you to be part of the committee. We're meeting next week. Glenn says, what day? Thursday. I'm busy. Call, uh, call Mitt, somebody, Mitt Romney. <laughs> this is the Glenn rep I know, focused. But Ford Motor Company called him one day and said, Glenn, we're naming a new car. We need some help. We want you to be uh, in the focus group. And Glenn says, meetings are a colossal waste of time. I, I just I don't want to be there. Can you help us? So he said, yeah, I'll try focus. So next time you're behind, <laughs> next time you're behind a Ford Compact, think of Glenn. <laughs> Glenn Rupp. Thank you, Johnny. A friend indeed. <laughs> really appreciate that. Uh, just to get some business out of the way, uh, this thing on my nose is a Band-Aid. It's a silicon Band-Aid. I had a little piece of cancer removed a few weeks ago and they did some plastic surgery. And so this is a lot better to look at than what's underneath it. And so you'll thank me for that. But uh, now you'll be staring at that the whole time of talking. <laughs> and that's the way it goes. Um, A general inside of a fort years ago was being besieged. His fort was uh, under attack by a very ruthless band of marauders who decided to siege the fort by building what they call a siege tower. And this is where you build it up with all the available wood and iron. And you simply uh, build this so that you can have your archers go on top and they would have these pots of fire and they would shoot the arrows and try to destroy the fort. The general was a wise general that was trying to protect and defend his fort and so he simply waited until they were just about done and the first flaming arrows came across. When he opened up the gates and released his best soldier on top of his best armored elephant. And his soldier took the elephant and simply drove the elephant up to the tower and smashed it, toppling the archers, toppling the fire pots, destroying all the available wood, and destroying that siege tower as the driver jumps off into a tree to safety, unnoticed, defending the fort. As the elephant proudly and royally strives off to the side, Inside of the elephants here was a little flea that says, we really showed them, didn't we? <laughs> I am that flea. We have elephants, and we think we did the work. And we have a we attitude. And really, what it amounts to is, when we look at focusing on something, I want to share with you the idea that it's about, uh, it's more about failure than it is anything else. And so when we talk about this topic today, it was supposed to be focus or fail. The actual topic should have been focus on failure because actually success starts with failure. And now, did that flea fail? No, he really didn't fail. But my name's Glenn Rep, and I failed many times. I'm supposed to say hi, Glenn. <laughs> In fact, I'm somewhat of an expert at it. 
So why does success have to start with failure? And uh, what can you learn from failure? Well, I failed a number of times. In fact, I've got a list here of ways I failed. I want to share this with you because I was 60 a few weeks ago, 30 years ago, half my life ago. Here are some of the things that I experienced. I was kicked out of college by the administration, and it was a Bible school, no less. <laughs> I had no money. I had no money for food for my family of four, so I had to go on food stamps. My wife didn't want to go to the store because she was too embarrassed to hand them. It was before electronic benefits. I had no money for utilities, so my rental unit, the electricity, was shut off. I had no money for rent, and my neighbor was a believer, the guy who owned the house, and he said, just hold on to it, and when you get back on your feet, pay me. That took three or four months. I, you never have, rent, never have a guy rent a house like that. I know I didn't when I rent my house. I had no car payments, so my car was repossessed while I was at the store. I came out and thought it was stolen. <laughs> and then I realized it was repossessed. I had four kids at the eight, before age 30. I had four kids, no health insurance, no life insurance, no assets, no nothing. A master's <laughs> degree in theology and a three-year-old who jumps up on the stove and burns his bottle of diaper on the burner, which is wiper right here. <laughs> so let me share with you, I know how to fail. I know how to fail all too well, but there's different ways to respond to failure. And there's wrong ways to respond. The first way to wrongly respond to failure is denial. That's the first thing. You don't want to deny you failed. You want to look failure in the eye. You also don't want to, as they say in, on, on Wall Street, chase your losses. You don't want to go after those things that are just not working. And you also need to know that you need to get moving in a different direction. It's what I call a pivot. We're going to talk about pivoting today, which is really what you do when you focus. And so I want to share with you some, uh, if you put that, Glenn's 20 ways to learn from failure. I just press this button here. Yeah. The right button. The right, right button. arrow. The, right arrow. Right arrow. Right. the difference between yeah. failure and mistakes. So let's look at this. <laughs> Seth Godwin said, a failure is a project that doesn't work, an initiative that teaches you something at the same time outcome doesn't move you directly closer to your goal. The mistake is either a failure repeated doing something the second time, you should have known better, misguided attempt. We need a lot more failures, I think. Hmm. Failures that don't kill us, make us bolder, teach us more in one way that won't work while opening up the doors of things that might work. Avoid stupid mistakes. <laughs> I wonder who designed that. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. Mistakes are an important part of life. You have to break some eggs. <laughs> That's a real picture there, folks. That's a real design of a couch. Oh my goodness. Wow. Take action. You can learn from by taking action. These guys are really taking action, watching the fire. Uh, some of these fires came close to our house when we lived in San Diego. Um, this guy's taking action. He's spray painting a sign. Take more risks. This is actually a guy on a bike with a mirror. I've seen worse than this, and of course the guys who've gone to India have seen worse than that too. <laughs> Dare to dream. Wrong predictions. Televisions won't last because people will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Drill for oil. You mean drill to the ground? Try to find oil? You're crazy. Refusing the suggestion, they drill for oil in 1859. Remote shopping. Entirely feasible will flop because women like to get out of the house, like to handle merchandise, and won't be able to change their minds. Time 1966, the so one sentence writing off e commerce long before anyone had heard about it. I built an e commerce company strictly on what you can see on the screen. No success without flops. Remember these? Yeah. The Cube, mm -hmm. the Lisa. Oh, you don't remember those because you have the iPad and the iPhone 5. Mm -hmm. Einstein's mistakes. We're going to talk a little bit about Einstein. Take a wow. look at some of the things of what he did and mistakes. There's 23 of them there. The website's down there. I'll get you the slides later. Plenty of mistakes. Like Babe Ruth, more strikeouts than home runs. Mm -hmm. Mistakes that worked. Super glue. LSD. Artificial sweetener. <laughs> Teflon. These are mistakes that worked. <laughs> this is one that worked and kind of didn't work. What degree is lean to 
tower piece. Anyone know? Seven, five. Seven, five. Fifteen seven five. It's one of those. It's changing. Yeah, Serendipity. It's changing. Ha happy accidents. Rubber. Vulcanized rubber. Charles Goodyear accidentally left a piece of rubber mixture with sulfur on a hot plate produced vulcanized rubber. Mm -hmm. The microwave oven. You know about Spencer, who uh, was actually next to it at Raytheon, and his candy bar melted in his pocket. And of course, post-it notes. Failed glue. Wasn't sticky enough. And then I got fed up with the bits of paper and. Uses hymn book, falling out, suddenly he thought that that's one way for, and of course, what company is this? Yeah. Yeah. And what do they do? They have lots of intellectual property. They're always experimenting, always failing. Famous examples, Vaseline, a chemist worked for an old company. Oil workers rubbed white excrement on pipes and scratches, Ooh. and some of them took Vaseline home to put on their, uh, the Vaseline jelly on, on what was born. And of course, Velcro. Uh, it was annoying burrs, and of course they found out that the little hooks, astronauts started using it. So those are some accents. You can actually use new words for failure, like nearly. That's a positive word for something that didn't quite work, but it's nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> That's a good English word. Forget best practices, learn from worst practices, okay? What are the worst practices? This is called failure week. They did it at top schools to build resistance, and there actually is a failure day. And it's in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. It's October 13th. It's failure day. It's Friday. Uh, make fun of failures. Uh, this guy. <laughs> Sometimes he just doesn't have an excuse. And uh, he just has a problem. <laughs> publish your failures. A journal of aerology. There is such a journal. Sure. And you can actually publish your mistakes oh, and your failures mm. and discover them. Forget perfection. Striving for excellence motivates. Striving for perfection is demoralizing. Forget perfection. 80% mm -hmm. is good enough. In business, that's true. Beta testing. Always beta testing. Love customer feedback. I love this one. We waited 30 minutes, no service. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's <laughs> <customer> <laughs> How about this one? This is a letter. These are telephone books. Dear Yellow Pages, see the big stack of unclean telephone books? Nobody wants them. Stop killing trees and get a new business model. Yeah. This says, look at your stock price. <laughs> of course, they have a new business model now. Don't, be, don't have to be the first. This is, of course, uh, what Gladwell said. He talked about not being first. He talked about Xerox. Uh, they didn't realize what they had. He talked about uh, um, Friendster, which was before Facebook. They didn't know what they had. They didn't do well with it. They were first. And he talked about... Uh, a Sony, that the e-reader, long before Amazon and others capitalized on. So you don't have to be first. Learn from failed business models. Here's a little cartoon. But what if it cannibalizes our existing range of obsolete products that nobody any longer wants? How's your business model? <clears throat> Never give up. Of course, that's uh, a, a, a diagram of, of a man who just passed who's, who's a very th different thinker. And uh, there's always tomorrow. Let's make better mistakes tomorrow. Let's try that tomorrow. And then more ways for innovation. This actually is a real thing. It's a toilet with a water fountain behind it. They thought they would combine. This is from Japan. They thought they would combine washing hands and drinking water out of the toilet. And think of it as the new uh, water cooler in your office. OK. So you could put the cup back on that. I wanted to get through those quickly. Failure. What is failure? I know how to fail. Well, how did it all start for me? And I've only got about uh, 15 minutes, so I'm going to have to truncate some of this. I started out going to school in 1971, decided to go to Bible school. I didn't have any money. My dad said, uh, sorry, but I want you to go to be a doctor. You did real well in science in high school, and I'm not going to help you go to Bible school. And so I went to school with the only money I earned from the summer and started my first semester at a college in Pennsylvania, Babs Bible College of Pennsylvania. First semester was almost done. I had already been a busboy. I already worked in the cafeteria. I realized I didn't have any money for second semester, not much. They allowed me to start. And uh, I was already at the point where I had to figure out how to pay the second semester freshman bill and what to do. I stayed home that Christmas. You know what it's like to stay home your first Christmas? You know what it's like to not go home, but to stay in the campus? And I worked. I found out one day in chapel that there was a, uh, 
a special group that got out, friends of mine that were a little bit older, who sang in chapel. This is a Bible school, remember? And uh, I asked them, I said, wow, that's a cool group you've got. His name was Ken Rudolph. And he played the trombone. These other guys played the trumpet. This was a wonderful group. And I said, what's that all about? He goes, well, we started this group. And the school has its travel weekends, and they paid my entire bill, room board, and tuition. How do you get to be a gospel team? He goes, oh, you, they just have to ask you to do it. Okay. So I got together and I thought, i got to pay a school bill. The cafeteria is not working. I need to do something. So I got Hugh Stutzman, Tom Weir, and Bobby Wigden, friends of mine. I says, guys, we're going to start a quartet. And so I got some music, went together, we practiced. And I says, we're going to sing in chapel to debut our quartet. And uh, I'd not sung before, really. And so we uh, practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And we sang in chapel. And we were so good on one song, just one. That's all we had. The repertoire was one. That I knew was so good that we ended up going out and buying, I bought outfits for all the guys because I wanted to get to show that we were professional. <laughs> and I went down to this place, and we, I, I must have bought the loudest outfits. It was a red and white polyester suit, and it was very bright. I thought it was cool. Others told me later it wasn't so cool. But we got up in front, and they thought it was a joke. They thought, who are these guys? It was a joke. And when we sang, they were blown away. After that chapel, the dean came up to me and said, Glenn, would you like to consider traveling for the school during weekends? I said, tell me more. Long story short, the Conqueror's Quartet traveled every weekend and all summer, paid my way through school. Uh, problem was I had an attitude with that school and I got kicked out my sophomore year. Uh, mm -hmm. Long story short, uh, I, get, I ended up having to go to another school because I didn't really agree with the administration of that school and went to Iowa for my sophomore year. Now, I had no money, no job, remember, I started another quartet, but this time I thought I'd better take voice lessons, and so what I did was I started taking voice lessons, and I met my wonderful wife who was playing the piano for my voice instruction, and started the quartet Men of Faith, did the same exact thing, bought nicer outfits, <laughs> went in front of chapel, sang the song, they asked us to travel for them, and I traveled for a couple of years, uh, singing all over the uh, Midwest, and uh, paying my way through college until I got married, and I got married Everything happens for me on 10. At the age of 10, I came to a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That was my spiritual birth. At the age of 20, I got engaged to my wonderful wife of now 39 years. And uh, uh, it was great. We, I, I just turned 21 when we got married. So at 20, I got engaged. Just as we got married, I, I had one more year of school. I was working full time, we were going down to her church to do the music program, two hours away, and I was in school full time my senior year, and I got straight A's my senior year. Uh, I was really focused. Talk about focus, that all I had time for was working 3 to 11 as a welder, going to school in the day, and on weekends, uh, doing the traveling <coughs> here at Folks Church. I had to learn to pivot, and this is how I helped figure out what I was going to do next. And so I ended up with uh, graduating and uh, we ended up taking our first church, First Baptist Church, Eldora, Iowa. And this is interesting because I really needed some experience and so this church hired both of us right out of school. Went up there, I was going to be the youth and music pastor and she was going to be the church secretary. And we were both full time and we worked for $45 a week. <laughs> Now, that wasn't in the 20s, this was 1975. <laughs> it's just that they provided the parsonage and paid everything, and you really lacked for nothing. You had a freezer full of beef and pork and all the milk you wanted. This is a, this is a farm uh, community. That was a one-year internship, and I was told that I was just to maintain this and that someone else was going to come a year later. And I just thought this would be fun to take this youth group of about 12 kids and see how we could grow it. And it's a very small community of 3,000, Eldor, Iowa. At the end of the year, we had over 70 kids in the youth group. All the other churches pretty much came to our youth group. And the church asked me to stay on and not to leave. And they were going to do away with the internship program. At that time, I thought, I already had my first baby. Tim was born. 
and he was two months old, I thought, I really need seminary. And so with no money, no savings, $200 in my pocket, a two-month-old, my wife and myself, we leave to go to Denver to go to seminary. No job, and school starting. In June we're there, school starts in September, and I have no money to pay for school. Now, I am a risk taker, but I'm very focused on what I want to accomplish. And so what I simply did was start to find work. I ended up having two jobs, ended up having plenty of way through school. During my time at school, I did learn one thing. I learned that um, it's, it doesn't pay to work for somebody else. All of a sudden I realized that I was working so much for this bank building and I was making so much an hour and my time was very small and my, my money needs were higher. And so I decided to start a little painting business. And so I started painting apartments. Believe it or not, here I am going through school, seminary. Now I have two kids and I'm painting apartments. Now when you paint apartments for an apartment complex, when do you think you normally have to paint the apartment? <laughs> the end of the month, right? Mm -hmm. And so all the painting was done the last three days of the month, the first couple of days. So I did all my work during those days. I got paid $60 to paint a one bedroom apartment. It took me an hour and a half, maybe two at the most to make $60. This was 1978, 1979. I ended up having people working for me. I paid them when minimum wage was $1.90. I was paying them $3 an hour, $5 an hour, or more, up to $10 an hour if they were really good, to paint for me. And all I did was administrate. And I had 20 people working for me, and I was painting all these apartments. I was also still, while I was painting, going to school and youth pastor and music pastor at a church all during my graduate years. Two babies at home. Busy guy. Um, I ended up graduating uh, with my master's degree and promptly getting out of ministry. Long story short, I um, ended up finding the senior pastor in a compromising position with a divorced woman and it devastated my world. And so, I just simply said, Lord, will you free me up to go into business for a while from this call for full-time ministry? And that's what happened. I ended up uh, developing businesses and ended up working for a company. But before that took place, I had a lot of failures. But let me tell you about the company that I started. And uh, I want to tell you about this in a different way. A lot of things happen in our life that are both good or bad, and we don't know sometimes whether it's good or bad. An old man in a valley with his son lived there a very peaceable life, didn't have a lot of material possessions, but he was a very happy man. In fact, his neighbors somewhat envied his happiness. At the end of uh, his uh, uh, savings, he ended up buying a wild stallion. Well, this is serious. It was a wild stallion. He bought it with all of his savings. The wild stallion came home, and everyone was in awe. The neighbors they bought a wild stallion, and when uh, one night, actually the first night he was there, he got out of the paddocks and ran away into the wild. The neighbors came by, and they were a little envious. Oh, such bad luck! Such bad luck! Your wild stallion, all your investment went away. He goes. Good, bad, who knows? A week later, the stallion comes back with all of these mares and brings back a whole horde of other uh, wild horses, and they all come in the paddock. By this time, he had already fixed it so they can't escape. And all the neighbors are jealous. They're saying, wow, how fortunate. He goes, good, bad, I, I don't know for sure, the old man said. The young son was out there trying to raise these horses and teach them, and one of the horses bucked him, rolled over on him, and broke his leg, causing him to limp. And all the neighbors were just so upset. What poor fortune! And he said, good, bad, I, I don't know. The king of the county decided to go to war, and he prescribed all of the young men that were able to go to war and fight in the front lines. And his son had a limp and didn't get to go. And then all the people said, good, good fortune. He says, good, bad, I don't know. The 
story goes on and on. He said, every point we see something that looks like it's bad and ends up being good. We focus on failure only for the fact that we can learn something. And so the old man. So here's what we need to do to fail productively. So what I'm going to tell you is to experiment where failure is sustainable. Experiment where failure is sustainable. Don't experiment where it's fatal. But please experiment where it's sustainable. And second, recognize when you haven't succeeded. How do you know when to pivot? How do you know when to pivot? So, how do you prepare for failure or how do you get ready to pivot when you have something in your life? And I've been at this place so many times it feels like a rehearsal for me. When I see it again, I see it again. But God is good. The first thing I want to share with you is four points. I want you to listen for feedback. Everyone has something to say. Some of it's good, like the neighbors. It's not good, it's good. They change their mind every time they heard the story. But listen for feedback, because feedback will give you some insights you don't have. Do you remember the movie Dumb and Dumber? When he's there with that beautiful girl, and she's saying, you, would, uh, you wouldn't have a chance with me for five million and one. And he looks at her and he says, so you say I got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> listen for feedback. <laughs> Secondly, remove your emotion or your ego. Be dispassionate. We get so wrapped up in our ideas, our designs, our plans, our things that we think we have to get done, and we become passionate about it. But sometimes they don't make sense, and sometimes we don't look at the cost-benefit analysis, and we get our emotions all upset when they don't go according to our plan. So then, third, detach yourself from the plan. Um, detach it. Just look at it as physically as you can. Von Moltkin said, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. That's been used over and over again. He was a, a, a 17th, 18th century soldier. But uh, you have a plan, you have to, as an entrepreneur, I'll tell you what, you can have a five-year business plan in the last five minutes once you see what the customer really wants. Fourthly, fail freely and fail often. In fact, plan to fail. Practice, discipline, pluralism, or duality. What I mean by that is, in every idea you have, 10% of it's good and 20% of it's probably not so good. Mm. And so get ready to cut off the bottom 5, 10, 20%. Now, when I went from being in business to being in church land, and I, I ended up getting ordained and being an executive pastor at a local church here, I ended up taking some of my business practices into the church, and one of them was to cut off the bottom 10% that's not producing. And so actually my very first week at the church, I let a gal go. I, I asked her, I said, what do you do here? And she says, really nothing. I have nothing to do. The missions department no longer needs me, and, and I've got uh, uh, no work to do. And uh, I says, well, do you want to be here? She goes, well, I have other things I could do. I says, okay, great. Thank you very much. We're done. Well, she, she didn't realize I let her go, and you know, it was, it was a big problem. You can't really do that sometimes in church land. It was a little harder than that. So, there are some great pivot stories I wanted to share, but I'm going to have to limit it to one pivot story. you got five minutes left. I want to limit to one pivot story, that's this. Do you remember, um, you remember CompUSA? Remember the stores they had? Do you remember who owned CompUSA? A guy named Slim. If you go to Forbes magazine, you'll see he's the number one or number two richest man in the world. Slim Carlos, billionaire from Mexico. I started a little company, I worked with a little company in Woodville called Cooler Guys. And we were looking to sell things on the internet, e-commerce. And one day I was at one of our uh, vendor shops, a place called Laser Mac, where they're cutting metal, and I saw he had all of these Marvel comic uh, <laughs> sculptures on his wall. I said, what's that? And he said to me, those are licensed products that Marvel allows me to make, and I sell them at Disneyland. I said, you have a license with Marvel? You know who they are? He goes, oh yeah. I said, do you think they'd ever give you a license if we took some of that and kind of put it on a computer, because we were selling computer parts? He goes, well, I could ask him. 
I said, what do you have in mind? I said, well, take that Spider-Man monument you have there. Can you make that 90 millimeters and we kind of put four screw holes on it and put it in the back for a fan for the back of a computer and make a Spider-Man fan grill? He goes, that's crazy. He goes, yeah, just see if they'll give you a license for it. So he called them up. They said they would, 11%. Cost a dollar to make, cost me a dollar 11. I blister packed them, had a Marvel medallion inside, sold them to CompuSA all day long for $20. They sold them for $39. $1.10, $19, $20. Sold them. That's just as good as software, right? Well, that was great. It's like the man with the wild stallion, right? Well, that sounds great. The neighbors all said, that's great. And we went from $5,000 a month in sales to $1 million a month in sales in 18 months. We didn't know what to do. I mean, we had to build a warehouse in Woodenville. We had a bond warehouse. We were getting container loads over from China, from Korea, and from Japan. Multiple trips to the Far East, going into the supply chain to find the vendors actually who did the work rather than through uh, people who lived in L.A. Um, one day I walk into CompUSA, and there's our Spider-Man fan girls. I'm all excited because it says PC Toys has all that there. And there's a CompUSA Spider-Man fan grill for $30, $10 less. Ours is 39 theirs was 29 And it looked just like ours, only didn't have the color, didn't have our logo. Same exact thing, I mean, shaped exact, colored the same. It didn't have the medallion, which was the little chain that said it was a Marvel comic licensed product. It just had the Spider-Man fan grill. No shape difference, no color difference, no material difference. Wow. The horse runs away. What am I going to do? Bad fortune. They stopped ordering. Our sales went down. It happened really quickly. Called all the stores, talked to my people in Florida and New York. Long story short, I ended up calling Dallas, where his office was, and just simply saying, can I talk to someone legal? I have something to share. Got a legal department. I said, you don't know me from Adam. I'm one of your vendors, is, but you need to know that there's about to be a suit file, and it's a heavy suit from a heavy client. They're called Marvel Comics, publicly traded. I'm not going to sue. They're going to sue because you've just infringed on their intellectual property. We have a licensed medallion product called Spider-Man and Fangirl, and you have copied it exactly, which is a no-no. And I'm just going to give you a heads up before I contact them, which is my obligation, because I have an agreement that says, if someone infringes, I've got to let them know. Well, once he heard that, he says, please hold. <laughs> and he comes back and he says, we'll investigate this and get back to you. Well, I got a call probably later on that afternoon says, we've taken care of everything. You know what that meant. The next morning, I walked into CompUSA, all the stores throughout America, they, they took off their non-licensed product, and they ordered a boatload of Spider-Man fan girls at $19 from us. They were making them for a dollar, too, but they didn't realize they were a licensed product. So the horse comes back with mares, the boy breaks his leg, good, bad, good, bad. The story goes on. I can tell you how I ended up selling that to investors, and that's where I got into ministry, because it was on the eve of selling that company that my pastor said, would you become an executive pastor of our church, the first one, and would you walk with me the last five years before I retire? And I did that, and it was the greatest joy of my life. All these things change. Don't focus on failure, but learn from failure. Take what is here, and remember the one thing. Remember City Slickers, when, uh, who was the guy? Mitch was out there, and he's out there with uh, Curly. 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 And Curly says, do you know what the secret of life is? Mitch says, no, what? And he goes, your finger? No. <laughs> yeah. One thing. Just one thing. Once you know the one thing, everything else you can forget about. And Mitch says, what's the one thing? And Curly says, that's what you need to discover. So all that to be said, what's my one thing? done a lot of things. I've been in business, I've been in ministry, and I'm enjoying right now what we're doing with ISOL. I'd enjoy for you to come tomorrow night to our dessert and see it. It's a kick to go to India and teach entrepreneurial leadership to seniors in college in India to give them a Christian worldview.
it's a ride and a half. I've been there three times this year alone, and uh, we have a great time. That's what ISOL does. See you tomorrow night if you can come. But I want to share with you in closing my one thing. My chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's part of the Westminster Catechism. 1 Peter 4.11 says that God in all things might be glorified. Do you know what the word glorified really means? We hear that word, it just means weight. It's heavy. Like if you took the whole world and you held it in your hand, how heavy it'd be? It's the weight of it, the seriousness, the gravity, the weightiness of it. And so when we give glory to God, and that's my chief end, I am giving him the weight he deserves. How much weight does God deserve? All of it. All of it. 1 Corinthians 10.31, not that this is uh, even on a, a pastor uh, in the past. This says, whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do to the glory of God the Father. Put everything you do, business, pleasure, eating, drinking, fellowship, friends, do it all with God as the preeminent to his glory. And it says to enjoy him forever. Do you think about enjoying God? That's my chief end, is to lift him up. It's the one great truth, the one great thing that I believe that God's given me from the age of 10, through Bible school, through the various turns of events of failure and success in business, to where I am today, working with David, with John, and, and going to India and teaching young people about how to be a business person. But the bottom line is the one thing. Focus on that. Everything else is second. Thank you.